In the months before the 1968 Mexico City Olympics, the track and field landscape changed significantly with the transition from dirt tracks to the synthetic rubbery style tracks that we have today. And so to take advantage of this new surface, the shoe company Puma unveiled a new track spike that was specifically designed for this new surface. And it used 68 micro spikes instead of the four to six larger steel nail-like spikes that had been used previously. And then almost immediately, the men's 200 meter and the men's 400 meter world records were broken using these shoes. And then just as quickly banned from being used at the Olympics, and then those world records were erased and declared invalid. Water shoe. Now if they give me the record, fine. If they don't give me the record, it's still fine. I feel that if I'd have ran it in Adidas shoes, I'd have run the same thing, as good as I felt today. Now as the information in some cases can be a little suspect, I'm going to do my best to present the data and then I'll let you draw your own conclusions. And if I get anything incorrect or you have anything to add, feel free to leave a comment in the comment section below. Hey, if you want to support the channel, go check out the Jumpers Junction merch. Long jump, triple jump, high jump, pole vault. Help support the channel by checking out this awesome Jumpers Junction merch. Have a good one. So remember I mentioned that the brush spike was designed by Puma. Well, to understand the story, you have to understand the origin of Puma and the origin of another shoe company, Adidas. You see, in the early 1900s, there were two German brothers who started a shoe company that focused on footwear for sports. The name of these brothers were Rudolf or Rudy and Adolf or Addy Dassler. And they invented one of the first versions of track spikes and they even had those spikes worn by Jesse Owens at the 1936 Olympics who then went on to win four gold medals, and from there their business took off. But when World War II began, things changed. You see, the older brother joined the Nazi military, taking an office job out in the ranks, where little brother Addy built barrels for the Nazis' anti-tank guns, and he stayed home. And this is very important because after the war, the older brother Rudy was imprisoned by the Allies, while the younger brother Addy took control of their footwear business. And I think you can see where this is going. After Rudy was released from prison, he accused his little brother Addy of ratting him out to take control of the business. And so in 1948, Rudy left the company and started his own shoe company. Little brother Addy Dassler's company would be called Addy Das, Adidas. And Rudy's company would be called Rue Das. And then a month later, it would be renamed to Puma. Well, 20 years later, in 1968, Adidas became one of the most powerful shoe brands in the world. And remember, Nike's rise was still a few years later at this point. So what made 1968 so unique was that this 1968 Mexico City Olympics would be the first Olympic Games to use the tartan track surface instead of the dirt or red cinder surface. This was a big deal. This was an all weather synthetic style rubbery track surface and it's very similar to what we see today. It adds a lot of grip, it's more bouncy, there's more traction. So in preparation for the Mexico City Olympics, the track manufacturer 3M, yep, I'm talking about the Scotch Tape Company, they constructed a replica track for the men's US Olympic trials, and they built this in California, just south of Lake Tahoe. And they did this because it was built at an elevation almost identical to the elevation of the track at Mexico City which by the way was the first and only Summer Olympic Games to be held at high elevation. And if you're not familiar with high elevation, it tends to add to the performance of athletes. Now, because up to this point, the shoes were always designed to provide grip to old dirt track surfaces, the normal shoes had four to six steel nail-like spikes. These were longer and they really dug into the dirt or the crushed gravel, right? But when they had this new surface, Puma unveiled this new shoe design that was really supposed to add grip and traction for this new surface. And they labeled this new shoe as the Puma model number 296. That's all. And in honor of the 68 Olympics, it had 68 spikelets or mini needle-like spike pins, which were laid out in two sets of three rows on the front of the sole of the shoe. It's kind of like a dog brush if you've ever seen one of those. It was also a better fit with a new revolutionary strapping system, Velcro, which was the very first time that Velcro was used on athletic footwear. Now only 500 prototypes were produced and 100 of these were shipped over to the United States to some of Puma's top sponsored athletes. And what happened? 
while U.S. sprinter Vince Matthews clocked a 400 meter new world record of 44.4 seconds. Then two weeks later at the 1968 Lake Tahoe U.S. Olympic trials, which were held on this new surface, John Carlos broke the 200 meter world record, becoming the first person to break the 20 second barrier with a time of 19.7 seconds hand timed or 19.92 seconds with the new auto time system, which also was the first time that the auto time system was used. This was then followed only moments later by Lee Evans breaking that newly set 400 meter world record with a new time of 44.06 seconds, also wearing the brush spike. Now, there's a few things that may have contributed to these fast times that I have to mention, right? First, they were all set at altitude, which tends to improve athletic performance. They were all set on this new track surface going from dirt or red cinder to the synthetic all-weather track. And also, they were all at big meets where performances mattered. Regardless, the records were set. Now, the rules at the time stated that the shoes could have no more than eight steel spikes. But the process in which athletes competed started to change, right? They switched track surfaces. So there was a lot of uncertainty regarding the regulations because of this new surface. Then two weeks before the Olympics, track and field's world governing body, the International Amateur Athletic Federation, or the IAAF, which is now World Athletics, they sent out a notice to all athletes competing that because it was an Olympic year, the rules regarding shoe design could not be changed. Now, I also found reference that the IAS also claimed that this shoe would damage the track, and also because it wasn't available to all athletes, it would give some athletes an unfair advantage. So they sent out a notification that this shoe was banned from being used at the 1968 Summer Olympics. Now, Puma obviously appealed and they argued two things. First, that the design of the shoe had six rows of these needle-like pins, which were a lot smaller, and so when added up, each row added up to less than a single steel nail spike of the prior model. And then their second argument is that because they changed the surface in which athletes compete on, they also needed to allow for appropriate changes to the rules for equipment design. But IAF denied any appeal and athletes were banned from wearing the shoe at the Mexico City Olympics. And then on top of that, they sent out a notice that any world records that were set using this shoe would be considered invalid. Then nine days before the Mexico City Games, Track and Field News published a notice that Adidas had developed an experimental sprint shoe called the Quill, which featured 42 mini spikes at the forefoot. Now, IAF had already made their stance clear about the rules on footwear, so nothing ever came from Adidas Quill spikes either. So to me, it clearly looks like both companies were working towards a similar design, but Puma clearly got there first. Now, we could leave it at that, and the story would still be pretty debatable, but there's actually a little bit more. And like I said earlier, I'm just going to give you some info I found, and I'll let you draw your own conclusions. So in 2014, Puma's employee magazine, the Puma Catch-Up, stated that because Adidas' own version of the shoe, the Quill, wasn't ready in time for the Olympics, that Addy Dassler, who started the company Adidas, he sent representatives to the IAF in the Netherlands and bribed officials to get it banned. Then in 2019, Sports Illustrated wrote a piece about the same topic and they interviewed a former German 100 meter and 200 meter world record holder from the 1970s named Steve Williams. And in this interview, Steve reveals that he went out drinking one time with Addy Dassler's son, Horse Dassler, who at that time was running Adidas. And he said that they blackmailed three IAF officials to make the ruling. And he stated that one guy was gay, another guy was involved in some kind of financial malfeasance, and another guy was cheating on his wife. So he basically said there were six guys on the IAF board, two of them were on our side, and we blackmailed three of them, so we won the ruling. Again, I don't know if any of this is accurate, but it's just information I found. So there's clearly was some existing bad blood even to this day between Adidas and Puma. So shoe companies actually found a way around the spike rule by putting these plastic little spikelets on the bottom, how it's ribbed. So they found a way around the spike rule by adding plastic spikes on the bottom. Pretty interesting. So the rules now state that there cannot be more than 11 spike pins per shoe and the rules are a lot more detailed and they specify the number, size, and type of spikes that can be used depending on the event. But I can't help but wonder what our athletic footwear would look like if the brush bike hadn't been banned. 
What would the shoe design look like nowadays if we'd had years of testing and athlete progression using that brush spike? It'd be pretty cool. So now I want to hear from you. What do you think was the reason for those sudden world records? And do you think they should have banned the 1968 Puma brush spike? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. If you like this, I have a whole series on banned techniques in track and field that you can go check out. Thanks for watching.